Welcome back, RMC fam, to the RMC Experience. I'm one of your hosts, Rachel Siegel. And I'm the other one of your hosts, Dan Hutchinson. And we're here to talk to you about how to practice. If you were with us last month, we talked about motivation for practicing. And now that you've taken your instrument out, you've decided to practice, what do I do? Before we hop into that, though, we have a few announcements of the goings-on here at RMC. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we recently had a performance event for our rock shops at the Stone Pony that was a roaring success. And from that event, uh, we released uh, a series of t-shirts uh, that are designed with the logos of those rock shops. Each of our rock shops got to work with a graphic designer to come up with a logo, and now you can pick up one of those shirts for yourself. It's on the uh, RMC website, right? Indeed. That's how you can find them. We have the RMC Fest, June 4th from 12 to 6 p.m. at the Garwood Rec Field. There will be food, music, and fun. Uh, you can win games. We have a blow-up uh, boardwalk game situation going on, which sounds super cool. So you'll play your games, you'll win prizes, you'll eat, you'll listen to music. I mean, does it get much better than that? I don't think so. And there are still some spots for solo performers, uh, so feel free to sign up as soon as you can. But if you don't get to it in time, do not fret. We are also going to have a side <laughs> stage for acoustic performers, smaller things, um, just like a legitimate huge music festival, because that's exactly what this is, a legitimate huge music festival. Six hours of fun, entertainment, food, prizes, music. You can't get much better than that. No, you can't. And I think if you're having trouble signing up, you can also ask your teacher to help you. That's Absolutely. usually what I tell my students. And last, we've got summer camps. It's almost summer. Woo! So we've got the ukulele camp. We have our rock shop camp, our acapella camp, run by Dan, a <laughs> songwriting camp, and our drum line and guitar. Is it just like group guitar? It is. Line guitar? Yeah, it it's is our guitar a group line guitar camp. camp. <laughs> and our group guitar camp. So if you are interested in any of those and... I don't think your uh, skill level matters. I think if you just want to be a part Absolutely. of it, you are more than welcome to sign up. See one of the teachers here or check out our website and uh, we can sign you right up. All right. So let's get into it. Oh, boy. All right. So we've managed to get motivated. We're ready to practice. We get the instrument out or we warm up our voice and we're ready to go. And what do we do? Well, first have a goal. You don't. You take your instrument out, you look at it, you don't, it, just like having so much music, so much time can be super stressful. Narrow it down, have a goal. I want to be able to sing measures five through 20 by the end of 40 minutes. That's a, that's a good goal to have. Or just, I'd like to be able to get through this piece without necessarily wanting to throw my instrument at a wall. Always a good, uh, always a good strategy. Or without stopping. Or without stopping. I have a lot of students that like to stop because they'll mess up. And going from the practice mindset to the performance mindset is also something you need to practice. Of course, um, <clears throat> that that's huge too. I mean, just going from, uh, yeah, from a practice mindset to a performance mindset is a whole big wall, and that's I think a big thing that we can talk about. Yeah. Uh, even we could probably spend a whole nother episode on just. <laughs> What the difference is between the practice room and the stage, yeah. the things you want to watch out for. And how for. you have to practice to get there. Yeah. Not even like to play your music, but to have that mindset. Tune in for that. Coming soon. <laughs> we should write that down. I like that. <laughs> so this is my favorite. Well, one of my favorites. All these are my favorites. I talk about this with my students a lot. There's constantly how to practice, you know, in our lessons. And I'm sure it's the same for you. Certainly. Um, don't keep going back to the beginning. So I have a lot of students who can play the beginning of their songs so well. And I love it. But they're afraid of the hard stuff. They don't want to practice the hard stuff because it's hard. Hard. It's not hard. It's unfamiliar. We haven't learned it yet. So don't be afraid to practice the stuff that you can't necessarily play. And don't continue to go back to the beginning. Because then the beginning gets super good. And the rest of it will still kind of sound bad. Yeah. Picture, <laughs> picture this. You're at a performance. And the person on stage has done just this. <laughs> They've exclusively gone back to the very beginning. <laughs> so they start their performance while they're on stage no 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 they haven't practiced while they were on stage okay. but like they're they're getting ready to do their performance leading up to the performance they had only practiced the beginning every time they got to a spot where they made a mistake they went back to the beginning and started again 
So you're sitting there, the performance starts, and you are absolutely enamored with the performance. You're, you're looking at your buddies like, this is amazing, this is awesome, we love this. And then all of a sudden, things start to kind of change. It's called a train wreck. Yeah, geez. okay, there's a couple little mistakes here. And then you realize that they probably, if they played it once, they probably only played the ending one or two times, uh, and it shows. Um, there is a, uh, there's an intimidating factor to playing the really, really difficult passages, but, I mean, the way that music functions, a lot of the difficult passages aren't until later on in the piece of music. Yeah. A lot of composers like to trick you. <laughs> and you know it's okay. But we, the rest of our list here, is how to combat that. So, you can isolate. Take one measure, two measures, whatever the specific passage, maybe a run, a certain jump in your voice, a diddle, riddle, paradiddle. <laughs> I think that's a rudiment. <laughs> yeah, one of those. Um, a chord change on a guitar, switching on the violin, the different um, positions. You know, you just take it and isolate it and practice it over and over and over again. So isolate and repeat. Yes. Uh, I've kind of uh, been a champion of a technique that I've been referring to as backwards practicing uh, with my students. Do um, you ever play Simon? Simon Says? Well, not Simon Says. There used to be this, like, plastic game that had uh, the light, the four different lights on it, and it would play a note, and you would have oh, to... Oh, I know, I know. That. I've never played it, but I know what you're talking about. And it's, like, a really long pattern. And you I have mean, to remember it. And you have to remember the pattern. Uh, I kind of use Simon as a comparison. So let's say you're working on a piece of music. Start at the very last measure. That doesn't mean play note for note backwards. It's yeah. just play that measure from the beginning. Although note for note backwards can also be a good way to practice. Yeah, I mean, it makes if, if you're familiar enough with it that you yeah. can play it backwards note for note, then you're, you're really getting somewhere. But if you play through that last measure from front to back and you're really, really comfortable with it and you can play it, consistently over and over again awesome now back up a measure can you do the last two measures together all the way through that's really really comfortable okay add the last three measures now obviously if there's like a bar of rest or if there's like something that's really really simplistic in the in the previous measure you might want to add two measures something like that because i will admit i'll be the first to admit that this process gets really really tedious it's something that like takes a lot of time but it's one of those things that guarantees success i do that with like passages that i have trouble with not necessarily sometimes i'll go backwards but sometimes i'll just do like measure at a time then i'll do two measures but then it's like overlapping so it'd be like one and two two three three four. Oh, absolutely and then one two three two three four because you also have to get into the passages that are troubling you and get out of them. That is just as important as nailing whatever thing that is ailing you. I like to refer to that kind of as a, as a brick and mortar technique. Mm. Like if you have the individual passage itself, that is a solid brick. That is a solid piece of your house. Yes. Solid piece of the, uh, of the, the piece of music as a whole. But if you can play just that and you can't get into it and you can't get out of it, it's just kind of an unsteady loose brick. Yeah. So by practicing leading into it and by practicing leading out of it, you've now sort of filled in the mortar on the outsides. Yeah. And sometimes that's the hardest part. You could nail like three measures that are troubling you by getting into it after, like if you play that over and over and over again, your fingers get it. But then after playing something else, forget about it. I always find <laughs> afterward to be the hardest uh, coming out of it. Because there's always that little sense of celebration where it's like, I got it, I got it, yeah. oh no. <laughs> but I panicked going into it because I knew I was having trouble getting into it. And then you're like, well, I did it once, I did it a bunch of times, now I have to do it after playing this other stuff. Ah. <laughs> yeah, working working a piece like that into context is, is often a pretty daunting thing, but well worth the effort put into it. Yes. Did we emphasize how much you need to repeat? Because you need to repeat over and over. Repetition is what makes you learn something. When you're studying... What do you do? You read something, you read it again, you answer questions about it. If you can explain it to somebody, that's how you know you've learned it. It's all about repeating, repeating, taking something from your small, not small intestine, um, short-term memory. And ah. Taking something and turning it from your short-term memory into your long-term memory and also creating in music the um, muscle memory. I was really interested in where you were going with the small intestine. I was thing. like, small intestine, large intestine. And then I was like, wait a minute. 
That's no. two very different systems. Short, <laughs> short term, long term. <laughs> now, it's also very important to repeat things. <laughs> and it's very important to repeat things. Exactly. Like where I was going with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was picking up what you were... Putting down. There you go. <laughs> so, um, there are foundational things uh, in every instrument, in every discipline, in every, uh, in every genre of music that help to define it and help it uh, to help to make things easier to understand as players or performers of these genres and, and players and performers of these instruments. Um, do not, uh, do not skimp over, uh, the absolute basics. You're going to hear this a million times from every teacher. Don't neglect your scales. If you're, if you're a percussionist, don't neglect your rudiments. Um, even if it's even if you're focusing on one rudiment a week, one scale a week, something, and only spending even just a fraction of your practice time on something, um, I like to talk to my students about um, because they talk about oh scales are so tedious and everything. Oh, my students say the same thing. They're like, "This is tedious," and I'm like, "Well, you want to be better, don't you?" The answer is always yes. Yeah. That's why they're there. That's why they're paying us for lessons. Yeah. They want to be better. Exactly. But you know what? So, I don't like scales either. <laughs> but <laughs> nobody can deny that they work. Yeah. Um, and what I'll, I'll tell students, I'll have them compare. Because a lot of my students, they're, they're younger. Uh, and I go over scales with them quite a bit. Uh, and they say, well, why do we need to do this now? And I said, well, if you do this now and you spend, let's say, 12 hours total learning, like, spread across the weeks or whatever. If you spend 12 hours total learning your 12 major scales to where you're really, really adept at them, you can comfortably move. If you spend those 12 hours, what is 12 hours compared to the rest of your life where you get to use them, play around with them, uh, create using them? Yeah. And all you have to do is spend just a little time at the beginning just kind of getting yourself acclimated to them and knowing how they work. Yeah, and you just have to show... A kid, a scale and a and a piece of music they want to play, and like, oh, look at that! I have one student. She's a freshman in high school, and she's very logically brained. And I had her all of her scales, major, minor, all three minors, and now she's playing like, like an, an arpeggios, and now she's doing like like different passages in a flute book, like that, and um. It's just like like cascading scales, so like starting C all the way down, B all the way down, all fun stuff like that. Um, but when I when she isn't working in a piece of music, I'm like, that's your C arpeggio, and she gets it. She can play it. If she was having trouble with it, automatically can play it. If I'm like, look, that's an arpeggio, or if I'm like, usually I ask her, I'm like, what does that look like? And she's like, I don't know, an arpeggio, and I'm like, yeah, you played all of them, you know them. <laughs> uh, by by creating this familiarity. All music becomes... Easier. Easier, exactly. Um, let's see. Oh, now for something that's extremely important. <laughs> yes. We're not in a race. Music, life, is not a race. You may think so as a kid, and when you grow up, you'll learn that everyone's on their own timeline. But when you learn something... Even if it's like you're in school and your teacher's like, you have to have this learned, we have a concert, we have a test, blah, 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 whatever. Take it slow. Because your brain is telling your fingers or telling your voice what to do. And if your brain is going faster than your hands, your fingers, your voice, you're going to mess up. So slow it down to the point where you can't mess up. And then speed it up once it's comfortable. My One of my favorite sayings. Do not... Well, if you... I'll say it, and then you'll hear where it's potentially confusing. <laughs> Do not practice until you get something right. Yep. Practice until you cannot get something wrong. Yep, which is something I need to tell myself more often, because <laughs> that is still something that I got to learn. I'm, I'm full of these, and by the end of, by the end of this, uh, this podcast, you'll hear a, a ton of them. Um, the, the favorite one that I'll use to piggyback on this is that practice does not make perfect. Mac, but practice makes permanent. Yes. Yeah. Only perfect practice makes perfect. And no one's perfect, so don't worry. <laughs> so, if you're uh, if you're trying to blaze through something as fast as possible, because that's how it has to be in performance. I have to do the, 
I have to do the Rachmaninoff piano number two thing. That's crazy fast. The fasting. Rachmaninoff piano number two. Yes. <laughs> we don't know what kind of number two. I, I don't I don't remember whether it was a, a sonata, sonata or, or a concerto. Con- exactly. But the Rachmaninoff number two is the really intimidating one for piano. But you have to move very quickly mm-hmm. and you have to like have very spread hand positions and everything. And if you're attempting to do that fast after never having never played it before or having never looked at it before, it's going to sound a lot like a cat running across a piano. Like, there's a lot of just sort of throwing your hands. Hey, my cat's a great piano player. <laughs> I, I would never argue that. Um, but if you slow it down, it starts to sound a little bit... Like very, Rachmaninoff. A little bit like Rachmaninoff. A little bit like music. Mm-hmm. Even if it's very slow. Even if it's just one little grouping at a time. Metronome's going to be your best friend here, of yeah. course. And make sure you're always feeling that beat, even if it's slower, so that, because if you slow down those sixteenth notes, those quarter notes are going to be way slower. Oh, absolutely. Metronome's going to be your worst enemy and your best friend. Worst enemy because it's going to make an honest uh, musician out of you. Yes. It, it forces you to be honest about where you are, because metronome don't lie. Unless they skip, and that's get a new metronome. Because yeah. sometimes that happens. The apps... The, oh, not... the apps once in a while will skip. Yeah. But also, like, if you have, like, the really old metronome... Oh, yeah, that... It does rock back and forth. I used to have that, and I found out that, like, the left clicks were going faster than the right clicks. You can calibrate it. You can? I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a way to calibrate them. Let's touch back on scales for a second. I don't think uh, I don't think we have uh, sung their praises or sung their uh, sung their practice enough. What else do you have in mind? Well, I mean, when you're working on scales in particular or when you're working on scalar passages, um, it might help to kind of alter your rhythms. Oh, like, that's my favorite. If you keep things like super, super even, it's going to help you quite a bit. But contextually, not all scales or not all passages show up with like even notation, even rhythms. Mm-hmm. So by changing them... You're kind of preparing yourself for as many different scenarios as possible. Yeah. You're also tricking your mind. Um, I'm talking specifically if you're playing like a scalar passes, like let's say you've got just a ton of 16 notes and you're like, <laughs> as I often am, and you just slow it down, you change the rhythms, you're, you're not thinking so much about what your fingers are doing or about what your hands are doing. You're not thinking about specifically the notes as much. You're, you're kind of just, well, you're thinking about the notes, but you're not thinking about the notes. You know what I'm saying? So, like, oh, yeah. you're not specifically being like, okay, I've got a B flat, a C, a D. You're you're just, you're playing them. Your mind is thinking differently than, and your fingers just kind of do it because there's a disconnect when you change the rhythm. Right, and it kind of starts to allow you to look past just the basic notes and things, and you can start looking into some of the higher level musical concepts. Mm-hmm. Um it's not just what you're playing, it's how you're playing it, how you're presenting it, how you're performing it, yeah. uh, which is a huge part of moving something from the practice room to the stage. Yeah. Once again, coming soon. Tune in. We talked about a metronome being your best friend and your worst enemy. Uh, it's going to be worse. This, this one has become more my enemy. Oh, I didn't, I didn't bring my phone in here. I oh. could play my favorite, uh, the tuning CD. Oh, Shout gosh. out to my grad school teacher, Rick Heckman, who showed me the tuning CD. It is everyone's worst nightmare, and you do not want to keep it on your phone because you plug it in, and A sounds. And all you hear is A, and that's not an A, but... Um, you were close. What was that? That was, uh, that was just a little under an A. Like, nice. You have, you have good pitch doubting. memory. Nice. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just you play with the drone, and you either can do a scale with it, see if all your notes are together because they're all going to like sit differently depending on what kind of scale you're doing, or you're, you're playing, um, like, a corral. Or if you just want to figure out what if your notes are in tune or not, it's way better to play with a drone. You could look at a, uh, a tuner. You could close your eyes, play the note, see if you're in tune. Which, by the way, if you're using a tuner, do it that way. Don't just, like, stare at it. Um, but also, it's helping your ears develop. Ear training. Big. Big a- in music. Absolutely. Even for you percussionists. Yes, well, I, I just realized that the the percussionists, uh, specifically also the piano players, are not actually necessarily going to have to worry about a tuner. Unless they own, 
like a a natural acoustic piano in which case uh yeah i always knew when mine was out and when my teachers was out i'd always be like it's time for the the tuner to come yeah just be like <laughs> you got the greatest ear <laughs> be like thanks and that again but, all comes with practice but also if you're a drummer in a band and you got you got instrumentalists or if you're an accompaniment accompanist on the piano, I mean, no one's going to really want someone to be like, hey, you're out of tune, but sometimes you can't hear it. So, you know, it's everyone's helping each other out as long as you're not mean about it. Like, Dan, what are you doing? Two cents flat. <laughs> oh, well. Like, someone might not hear it. Be like... You'd be oh. that aggressive over two cents? No, I oh, okay. Makes, I wouldn't even hear that. <laughs> it makes it makes a, it, a lot of a difference there. And yeah. it's nice to have, like, people, just the way that it was nice to have people kind of help to hold you accountable uh, to get you to practice. It's also nice to have people kind of hold you accountable for what you're practicing and how you're practicing, whether it be intonation or if they hear something off about your playing. It's good to have someone listening in, an additional yeah. ear. Because it's also hard to, like, listen to yourself. Sometimes you have to learn how to actively listen. Sometimes it's hard when you're playing something to you know what it is that you did and to go back and, like, reflect on it. But having other people around... It really helps with that, too. Now, what happens if you don't have someone around to perhaps watch your technique? Well, you'll always have someone around when you have a mirror. I tell my kids all the time to practice in front of a mirror. I've got kids with the clarinet not covering the finger. I have one kid who likes to put her thumb over the, the rest because it's more comfortable, but then she, like, she, I swear... She's oh, gonna have an goodness. indent here. That is permanent indent. That's so tough to that's yeah. So tough to hold that way. Yeah. So we're working on it, but like you'll see it, especially especially with the clarinet covering all those holes. Because oh yeah. Sometimes you're squeaking. You're like, what am I doing wrong? And you're like, oh, my hole wasn't covered. Now, if you're playing like guitar or bass, um, it's it's good to be able to like look into the mirror and see like, uh, yeah, I'm working on all of this stuff, but like now I'm kind of all. It's tensed up and oh my goodness it's it's good to be able to sort of check posture yeah. start to learn your distances based on a mirror uh if you're a vocalist making sure that you're constantly keeping that nice posture and you're not tense oh right? yeah isn't that a trying thing? to keep the tension out tension out of your neck absolutely yeah um now let's say you're looking at sheet music something like uh you're, you're working on something particularly uh that you don't really have the ability to look up at the mirror um and, and check yourself in real time. What do you do then? You can record yourself. We all have phones. Our parents have phones. Our schools gave us laptops. We are now in post-pandemic age. We've got, we've got the technology. You've got a camera on you. I don't know why I snapped. That one wasn't unnecessary. But you've got a camera on you at all times. Film yourself. I film myself all the time. Recording yourself is humbling. Because, I, I don't know, maybe maybe it's not the same for children. You all are fearless. But for adults, we've learned fear. And watching myself play is kind of cringy sometimes. So, like, in the era of, uh, of like, everyone making those multi-track videos, watching myself back, I was like, oh, gosh. But I got better because I was listening to myself. And I was like, oh, let me do it better next time. And, I mean, it helps to get... You're getting performance experience while practicing because you can go back yeah. and uh, you can just plain listen to yourself and go, oh, there were some spots that felt a little bit shaky. I should probably go back and check on that a little bit. Uh, if you're doing video, you can look and go, ooh, I definitely don't want to make that face while I'm performing, like Me if I'm singing. always. Uh, Watch any recital video I have. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always, it's always good to have something to listen back. And mm -hmm. it's a fantastic excuse <laughs> if, if like, let's say there's a day where it's like, oh, I'm not really, I'm not really feeling getting the instrument out and playing right now, but I recorded myself yesterday and I didn't necessarily listen to it the whole way through. I'm going to start listening critically. Yeah. Grab so, your pencil. Yeah. Grab, grab a pencil, down. throw in your headphones, just kind of double check and go, and you get to be a critic. You get to go from musician to critic. Of course, you're critiquing yourself, which, uh, no shame in, of course, but you might find a little bit of hesitation in that. Yeah. It gets easier with time, listening to yourself. It does. Um, for your vocalists out there, you can record yourself singing to a track. If you have your computer or an iPod and a phone, you just have it playing. 
You sing, record yourself, see if you're in tune, sing if you're see if you're singing the inflections correctly, um, if your timbre is um, is how you want it to be. Timbre is basically the tone of your voice. For those of you who don't know, um, yeah, yeah. Also, a great a great tool. I mean, as a vocalist, uh, if you record yourself, uh, you have an excellent opportunity to practice harmony, just the way that you talked about with multi track videos. Yeah. If you're if you're playing you're not beholden to perhaps record the exact same thing a second time. You can record a harmony over it yeah. and start getting used to kind of how voices interact. And then you can start to kind of feel uh, part independent. And you can do that with duets too. If you want to sing a duet with yourself, record the first part and then sing with it or record the second part, sing the first part with it. During the pandemic, I was having my kids anytime like the Rubank book had a duet. I had oh, them absolutely. record it so they could feel it when we were virtual. That was my favorite thing in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something that my, my teacher would assign every single week. It's like, all right, here's a duet. You're going to record the bottom. You're going to play the top or you're going to record the top, play the bottom. That's good. Um, and I, I found very, very quickly just how daunting of a task um, just recording for the sake of performance was. Yeah. Um, but if you're just recording to practice and you're recording to uh, just kind of mess around and experiment with music itself, uh, always, always a good idea. Yeah. So we talked about listening a little bit. We're going to talk about it more. Like I said, active listening is hard to do, and the recording yourself can help you do that, too. Um but not only should you listen to yourself practice, you should listen to people that are better than you, professionals in your field on your instrument. Go to live shows, listen to live recordings on YouTube. I love YouTube. YouTube is the best thing to happen, not only to musicians, but yes, to musicians, but like in the world. There's so much out there. Actually, I, so I'm in an orchestra, mm -hmm. and the clarinet player, the guy who plays first with me, was talking about how his teacher... I have to ask him the name because it's like some some like famous guy that was in one of the major orchestras. But all of his master classes are online. And he was like, I'm taking I'm taking lessons again with my favorite teacher and he's dead. Like I'm taking lessons from him beyond the grave. And wow. I was like, that's cool. So like there's so much out there. And listening to people that are better than you and you figure out what you want to like what you want to sound like. Let's take the oboe, for example. The oboe is the first instrument, well, first wind instrument I played. And I studied it in undergrad and in grad school but it was my major instrument and there's european oboists and there's american oboists there's a different read different scrape i don't like the way european oboists sound they sound kind of like widespread and kind of you can like hear the read it's very woody american oboists sound like butter like melted chocolate it's so smooth and beautiful and dark and i love it and you find that out by listening to people listening to different people and i would have never known that if i didn't listen to different oboists Absolutely. And I mean, there are, uh, there are plenty of videos of musicians on all instruments, uh, and vocalists of all different genres and everything, um, that are incredibly positive role models to kind of listen to. I mean, we all talk about who we look up to. And in this case, we could talk about who we listen up to. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, so I'm in addition to being a, a winds player, I'm also a vocalist. Um, I love, love, love listening to barbershop music. I love listening to the King Singers. I love listening to a lot of these close harmony things where uh, I can listen in and kind of analyze the balance between the different voices and everything. Uh, I, love, I love listening to different bass singers and kind of how they're approaching the, the sound. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know if you could tell. Me too. But I, <laughs> I, I sing a, quite a bit of bass. Uh, so there's a lot of different approaches. So finding someone you like for what they do, finding something you like as far as a genre, um, gives you a really good idea of, uh, what you want to sound like. And in a lot of ways, uh, again, thanks to the power of YouTube, it'll give you a lot of great ways to get there. Yeah. Like there are interviews from musicians all over the world um, who are basically like trendsetters for entire genres of music that talk about, oh, this is what I used to work on. This is, this is what I worked on when I was trying to do this, when I was trying to play like this. Uh, so it can help to kind of steer your practice as well. Yeah. Especially for you rock band kids out there too. All you rock shoppers and you guitarists and your drummers and piano even. 
Um, just find your favorite band, see what their musicians are doing, how they're doing it. Look at techniques, slow down their videos to see oh. if you can figure out how to do it. I do a lot of my um, arrangings that way. I'll slow down YouTube. You can slow down YouTube. You go to the little the little gear for kids who don't know what a gear is. <laughs> it's the little circle that goes like this. Mm -hmm. And you click it and you press speed and you can speed it up or you can slow it down. And it helps. Now, as a as an addition to that, I don't know, a lot of a lot of my students seem to have Google Chrome. Do you have Google Chrome? Mm -hmm. Uh there is a Chrome extension that I found that has been absolutely indispensable for this. Uh, it's called Cadenza. If you download the Cadenza extension, uh, it actually puts a little menu underneath every YouTube video, mm -hmm. and there's two little drag bars. One of the bars you can drag, and it will change the speed at like, like nano level. Like oh. it will, you can slow it. You can slow it all the way down to like ten percent, but it does it like in really small increments. The uh, the issue I always find with the the playback speed thing is that you only it's have so 25, ridiculous. 50, yeah. 75%. And then you're like, no. And it's like, I think I got it now. Oh, it's too fast now. Yeah, I went from 50 yeah, yeah. to 75 and it's way too fast. Yeah. But there's a drag thing that moves, uh, that moves the tempo without changing the pitch so you can even continue to play along. I need that. The other bar changes the pitch without changing the tempo cool. in case you want to transpose if you want to put something ah. in a more comfortable key that's cool transposing is a good way to practice too because then that works on your ear and your scales and your scales yeah it all um, interconnects i need to get that i have a few arrangements that i need to finish <laughs> i have to get that so uh we are hoping that through uh through our little discussion today uh we were able to kind of inspire some of you to uh to pursue uh, different avenues of practice, different techniques in your practicing, try them. Reach out to us. Let us know. Uh, let us know how how it worked for you. Uh, if you have any additional questions, or if you'd like us to cover any particular topics here on the RMC Experience, by all means, uh, reach out to uh, podcast at rmcstudios.com. That is our email. Um, you can also contact us through Instagram if you. DM the RMC Studios Instagram. Liz will get it to us. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know if the Facebook works the same way, but... I think so. Like any, any contact you have with RMC Studios, in one way or another, can get back to us. Uh, and we really... We look forward to making this a, uh, a great forum to talk about all of the coolest topics in music, all the, all the hot-button issues of music. Uh, yeah. We're excited, so really, absolutely, talk to us. We want to talk to you. Reach on out. Uh, join us again. Uh, In June? Yes, join us again next time on the RMC Experience.